Thank you so much, Shiva. Steven, Linda, Shane, thank you so much for, for coming today. It is wonderful to have you guys. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you so you. much for having us too. Awesome. All right. Let's get this kicked off and learn where we should put our money, honey. So uh, again, for the viewers, we have Stephen McClurg, who is the CIO of Exponential. We have Shane uh, Kahoe, sorry if I'm in, mispronouncing that one, co-founder of SBK Crypto, and Linda Goetze, who is the president and CEO of the Blockchain Chamber of Commerce. And I am going to just get right into this and start with you, Stephen, if that's okay. So, Stephen, you Absolutely. have made some scary statements recently about the S&P potentially falling all the way to 1500. So what's going on with the markets and how does this affect how you look at the crypto market? Is it doom and gloom for both of them? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, if you, if you look at the S and P uh, forward price to earnings ratio, we are higher now than we've ever been prior to any other recession. So as a matter of fact, if the S&P were to drop 20% today, we would still be higher prior to, to the last two recessions. And um, that's actually not typically where S&P forward price to earnings ratios are even in a recovery. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you look at where we expect earnings to be, which is closer to somewhere between 100 to 20, and price to earnings ratios of where they typically are during recessions, which is between 15 and 16 times, uh, then we get to those levels pretty quickly. Um, what a lot of what a lot of the market is including right now in its estimates are the massive amounts of unemployment that's happening around the world. And since I'm in the U.S., I am a little bit more U.S. centric. Uh, but in the U.S., we're already at 25% unemployment rate. And, in, and if you include a lot of gig workers and people that are underemployed, we're probably closer to 40%. So we do expect that the S&P will drop pretty significantly. And I do expect other crypto assets, such as Bitcoin, uh, to begin to behave, again, just like a risk asset does. Uh, we've seen that happen anytime that there's been a risk off trade. Uh, so uh, I do expect to see a, a precipitous drop in, in financial markets, such as equities, as well as cryptocurrencies. Thank you, Sen uh, Stephen. And Linda, turning to you, first of all, incredible background. I read that you've been involved in Bitcoin since 2012, which makes you an OG. Just have to say that one. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you specifically, how have you seen the evolution of investing in the cryptocurrency and blockchain industry, and do you think it's been a positive development? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak from my experience first, because it's not something that I, I feel like I can speak for the entire industry. Um, but there, there have been shifts initially when I was first looking at blockchain it was really just Bitcoin, right? So that's that's the reality. Back in 2012, there wasn't really anything else to engage with, and so my initial experience, it was it was all about Bitcoin. And then we saw obviously Ethereum and, and other tokens and coins coming to the to the party. And 2017 was really uh, a big party. Lots of um, unfortunate. Uh, scams that were a part of that, as well as some really great projects that have continued to grow and thrive and live up to the promise of their ICOs. And we've seen, obviously, the transition into STOs and, you know, some of the same pain points in the industry still exist, regardless of the attempts that have been made to, to regulate. And it, it's getting better. So I would say it's, it's trending towards a, a positive direction where it's it's not just about investing in Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. My personal investments have, I would say, in large part shifted to being in blockchain companies that are actually utilizing the technology to create new marketplaces, to, to really build infrastructure differently. And so I, I think there's that, that trend. And um, in, in Africa, we've seen, you know, interesting projects like Yellow Card, 
uh, help facilitate the investment in blockchain through cryptocurrencies. But then there's also the focus on education that is very much, you know, blockchain, 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 not, you know, cryptos or Bitcoin. So it's, it's an interesting balancing act that, that we have currently where there's an acknowledgement of the value add of Bitcoin and some other cryptocurrencies, but a awareness that the implementation of blockchain as a technology is really where there's going to be the, the most enterprise uh, adoption. And we have with the Blockchain Chamber of Commerce, 12 verticals that highlight the areas in which blockchain will be truly impactful. And, you know, government is beginning globally to use blockchain technology. We, we're seeing just a, a massive um, awareness that has been built that there is a change, a shift, and, and countries don't want to be left out. So the fear of missing out has gone from being just, you know, individual investors, you know, saying, oh, you know, my buddy bought Bitcoin and, and he quadrupled his money or he 10x and I, I don't want to miss out on that. I'm going to jump in the market to countries saying, you know, hey, Estonia did this, um, you know, we're seeing this in Dubai, this paperless, you know, effort. China is saying that this is going to be, you know, what's going to drive uh, their investment in, in innovation in the coming years. And nobody wants to get left behind. So I, I don't know if that fully answered your question, but there's, there's a lot of nuance in, in where we've come from. And there's a lot of impetus in, in where blockchain and cryptocurrencies are headed. And a chaos there is definitely one of those. So, yeah, Stephen, I agree with you. Thank you, Linda. Very interesting. And I definitely have some follow-up questions for you there. And for sure, I appreciate that you actually said fear of missing out rather than the rest of us saying the FOMO. So <laughs> that's nice. Not, not everybody, um, not everybody in the 8,000 here are, are necessarily, you know, the, the ones that understand, you know, OG and FOMO and, you know, all of the buzzwords that, that we use in the biz. So, Yep, yep, yep. Uh, awesome. Well, thank you so much. We're definitely going to come back to some of the points that you said there. And Shane, uh, thank you so much. So you have a very fascinating background. I watched an interview that you just did on Global Live Media where it said, or you were saying that your VC is focused on companies who are interested in utilizing the EOS platform. Now, some analysts have reported concerns about EOS regarding its centralization, that contributors building on dApps on EOS have made little to no money, the hackers who have stolen, um, there was an issue with the EOS failed update, and there's currently a class action lawsuit against Block One regarding EOS token sales. So I actually, you know, I wanted to ask you, are you concerned about these vulnerabilities? I think you're muted. Uh, Shane, I think you're muted. Unless it's just me. Okay, I think I'm on now, right? Perfect. Great. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here today. I really appreciate uh, Aon Summer putting this all together. And lovely to meet uh, my, my panelists as well. So thank you so much for considering me for this. Um, really, let, let's let's take a step back, right? Because irrespective of, of protocols, uh, cultures, gangs, like you really have to, to look at just actually how far we've come, right? And when you look at the space and the adoption which has occurred, certainly in the last three to five years, it's amazing. The space has matured at a rate of knots that we have not seen before. And it's wonderful, finally, to be in a room where you're now dealing with enterprises, you're now dealing with regulators, you're now dealing uh, with compliance, legals, um, venture capital firms that are traditional VCs putting money into the space. You know, we, haven't see, we have not seen that type of maturity in, 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 in this space as yet. And it's wonderful. I mean, when we look at the space and the way that, that we view it, sure, price action is interesting. It's like a ticker tape at 24-7. But really, to be honest with you, that's not what drives us. What drives us actually is sourcing, analyzing, and investing into the latest blockchain technologies that will be the next billion dollar IPOs on the Nuenmark, the New York Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, are, 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 are even, even in, in, in the US on, on, on the NASDAQ. What we're looking at is 
not not a situation anymore where we have a branding issue. It's not a situation where we don't have any capital. It's a situation of really looking at this as a totally new asset class. And just even what's happened in the last 12 months, just in the DeFi space alone, it's unbelievable. So I think, although I have a background in investing and I'm very much a, a generalist, what I do believe is that over the next 10 to 20 years, this this space will be the space where you will start to see each and every industry vertical challenging what we have have today. And certainly from a VC perspective, we make investments into the space. We're not buying tokens. We don't have any exposure with regards to price action. But in the last three years in the VC space, you've seen about 322 deals in 2017, about $1.2 billion. In 2018, about 830 deals with about $7 billion invested. And last year in 2019, about 622 blockchain deals invested with about 2.7 billion. When you look at this, the opportunities that we are about to see are endless. And it really feels like we're back at the early stages of the internet, 92, 93, 94. And for that, and also when we look at it, we're really, really excited to be where we are. Um, we, 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 we know where it's early. We know it's a very, very nascent space, but we're very confident. Um, we're very happy to allocate cash into the space. Thank you, Shane. Switching back to you, Stephen, our asset manager, to learn from your perspective and regarding Shane's comment about price action and that the, the various nuances um, that go into this interesting space from an investment perspective, would you make different recommendations to retail investors about investing in the crypto market rather than for your clients who you're a fiduciary for? Yeah, that's that's a... That's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think at the moment, uh, as far as our clients who we're fiduciaries for, um, I think it's uh, it's pretty prudent to avoid most risk assets, um, whether it's uh, high yield bonds or equities or um, or, or crypto. Um, as as you know, a lot of uh, cryptocurrencies or crypto assets. Um, whether it's whether it's Bitcoin, which is really where I'm mostly focused, or uh, other uh, tokens that represent protocols, um, they really don't behave the way that they will long term at the moment. Uh, at the moment, they do behave like risk assets. Uh, they're speculative in instruments. People really don't know what they're buying. Um, retail, though, some people have gotten lucky, uh, or a lot of people have gotten lucky um, from a retail perspective. Um, People really don't understand what they're buying. They're just, uh, you know, everything's moving in lockstep with each other. Um, Bitcoin, which is very different from Ethereum, which is very different from Ripple, um, all move together in a in a correlation band. So, as people start to understand what it is that they're actually buying, then um, these things will start behaving the way that they should. For instance, uh, Ethereum, um, we're we're actually writing a piece this week uh, on, you know, why Ethereum should continue to go lower or why ETH should continue to go lower. And uh, it really has to do with what it is and what its purpose is. It's, it's gas for a network. And any other protocol token that's gas for a network, as, 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 as you all know, as technology uh, continues to advance, then, uh, it should depreciate in value. Uh, think about a cell phone, for instance. Um, you know, you get more and more data every year, but you're paying less money for your overall data plan than you did 10 years ago, and you paid less money for your overall data plan then than you did 10 years prior to that. And so as, as technology becomes useful, as it increases exponentially, uh, these, uh, you know, these, these protocol tokens should always go down in value. And when people begin to realize that, then you'll start seeing a very different behavior in the market. Like, I, th I really think you got to ask, I mean, you, you, you asked even a, a very, very good question there. And you, you, you mentioned that, you know, what are investors looking for? I always ask an investor, what are they looking for? Like, are they looking, are they simply looking for gains? Are they looking for short term, medium or long term? Do they want to own something? Do they believe in the project that they actually want to have utility going forward? And I, I agree, everything moves in lockstep right now, because when you look at the overall size of the market cap and how everything is highly correlated, I mean, it is all moving in lockstep because there's no way to value any of these deals. There's no way to value any of these tokens. There's no price to earnings, P, cash flow forecasts. It is all, it is all speculation for now, and you have to be aware of that. 
And if you're getting into a speculative market, you have to realize the vol that's, that's, that's surrounding it, the volatility. You have to be able to write down 90% of your investment. And do you have the ability to hold and run that position? If you're on leverage, probably not. But then again, you shouldn't be in this market. This market to me is not about quick money. It's never been about quick money. I mean, there should never be about that. It should be believing in a better way, an open and transparent, decentralized way. And if you understand that and you realize where we are in that adoption curve, then it's a long-term trade and you have to buy and hold. Sure, if you have to hedge a position or something r runs up and you want to take some money off the table, by all means do it. But you have to realize the underlying volatility of this asset class, which can be 5x or 10x to the upside when you look at it and you monitor it against, I think you were talking about S&P returns, it's, it's ridiculous to see the amount of, 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 of alpha you can generate, but also you have to be prepared that if you're getting into this on a speculative standpoint, you have to be prepared to lose 95% of your money and more depending on what you've invested in. And that's just the way the market is right now. I, Thank I you, want Shane. to jump in oh. on this. Can I, can, do you jump. mind? <laughs> no, um, of course, Absolutely, the, the long-term perspective is key. And I, I don't think we're at the point yet that Ethereum is just going to continue to go down, down, down. Although long term, I believe you may be right in regard to that. Um, it's where we are in the adoption curve, right? We, we have so much further to go before we actually reach mass adoption. Um, you know, I, I didn't realize that, you know, 2012 was so early until 2017 when there was the hype cycle that happened then that I was a quote early adopter. Um, but s currently even people that are getting into any type of cryptocurrency, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum and others, it, they're also early adopters. We're, we're nowhere sure. near mass adoption. And sure, but, but, when but, you but, have but, limited that's, supply that's, that's okay. and growing like, demand, right? Absolutely, but there's no rush. What, what, what's, what's the rush? Or shouldn't you just let let the market do what the market's going to do? And when you're looking at mass adoption, it's got it's going to happen when it happens, right? And by the time it Absolutely. happens, it's too late. To, it's too late to put the trade on. But what's the rush? <laughs> let the market do what the market's got to do. And uh, the great thing is that this almost feels like venture with a live ticker tape. Uh, it almost mm. feels like that retail have got in ahead of Wall Street, which is obviously true. So you've got to let these things do what they do, and you've got to let the smart, you know, the smart developers, which have led the way, the libertarians the cypher funks and now you can actually see where where you where you now start to see enterprise coming in and really pushing this thing and it, that's amazing what you've seen on the enterprise level you 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 know it's going to happen right our, our our fundamental conviction is 100 percent on the space 100 percent. the only thing that i can control is time so you let time do what time does and you just let it get on with it be you place your trades, you keep your conviction on, you continue to do the work, you continue to learn. Nobody is an expert in this space. I cannot stand Absolutely. when I get to these conferences and this guy's an expert in blockchain. That's bullshit. He's not. He's just said that because he's trying to perceive some days. Not. This technology is so new and so developing each and every day. It's wonderful to be a part of it, but we haven't even seen anything on this side of stuff. It really is. We are back in 1992, 1993, the internet, and we don't even think back in those early days that the most powerful thing in the internet was actually going to be the data that it was created. Like We are, we are that blind to the capabilities of where we are right now. So let it do its thing. Be patient. Yeah. You're, you're right, Shane. And um, if you haven't heard of the baseline protocol and, well, and what it's doing the in the news, yeah, <laughs> that's, um, that's one to, to watch where I think there's going to be fun news tomorrow um, in regard to the baseline protocol and some, some pretty big enterprise names. So it's, it's going to be fun to watch uh, this, this adoption curve uh, continue to uh, go parabolic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Well, thank you, Shane. Thank you, Shane, I'd like to, um, uh, Stephen, jump in anytime if you have a uh, well, follow-up. I was going to say, yeah? it's actually dangerous to pick a protocol and buy it and hold it forever, thinking that it's only going to go up, right? Because, you know, if, if you had done that with the Palm Pilot, because, you know, it was really, really cool when you could plug a device into your computer and download all your emails and then go out to lunch and answer emails and you come back and you could plug it back in and all those emails would go out. That's, that's, that's really cool. You've never been able to do that. You've never been able to send emails from a device away from your computer. And if, and if people had just like piled all their money into palm, you know, guess where they would be now. 
But instead, they piled all their money into BlackBerry. And if you were just like sit in the BlackBerry and hold that, because that was even better technology, guess where you'd be right now, right? And then the Apple came out, right? So, so when you really look at some of these protocols and people are making these massive outsized bets without thinking about risk management at all and not doing their work, as, 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 as somebody else had mentioned, and you just like sit and wait, well, that t- technology is going to be overtaken. I mean, like EOS is a good example. EOS is like the laser disc. Everybody thought it was like the, the coolest thing since sliced bread, and nobody's using EOS anymore, and the developers have all moved on. Um, you know, Ethereum is probably the strongest horse in the protocol area, but there's other protocols that are being built every day. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I don't know if you saw the news uh, a couple of months ago when JP Morgan was looking at uh, coming together and uh, with, uh, with, a, with consensus and continuing to build out the Ethereum uh, protocol uh, in conjunction with them. Well, I don't know if you've also seen the news that that deal's fallen apart because all the major banks have decided to build their own protocols. So, uh, you know, technology can be replaced, technology can be replicated, and uh, and if you and if you take all your money and make an outsized bet on one protocol and just sit and wait for ten years, well, a better protocol is going to come out, and uh, and that's what we're seeing. And and you know, I'm not a necessarily a well, I'm I, I'm a Bitcoin realist. But right now, that's that that seems to be the strongest force, not not as far as a protocol standpoint, but as far as an adoption standpoint. Uh, oh, I so, I uh, I and I've yet to see something replace that from a you know from 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 what Bitcoin does. But from a protocol standpoint, you know who knows what protocol is is going to be used and what's going to be adopted. And if you dump all your money into one protocol and hope that that's going to be the winner, then I think you're going to lose. Who's uh, Steve? Um, I totally agree. I think in the future there'll be protocols, many different protocols. Some protocols will be free, fast, and scalable. Some protocols will will be uh, security. Some protocols will be for social media. Some protocols will be uh, for for land registration. Some protocols will be for medical records. Just like operating systems, um, I believe that in the future there'll be many different protocols for many different uses, and some will be. Some will be grade A secure, some will be open open source, some will be proof of work, some will be delegated proof of stake. I mean, when you look at some of the protocols that are coming on with the likes of uh, Definity, Kadena, Hedda Hashgraph, all excellent in, in their own right. And I think um, it's, it's not just about any f- focus w- one protocol. We're too early in that stage. It's not a winner takes all. The, the, the future will have numerous different blockchains for numerous different industry sectors and uses, and there will be interoperability of, um, amongst them for sharing certain information. And that's the world that I see. And that will take time. And I think that we just have to let these protocols be built and see which have the best user cases. And let's see which goes on from there. I mean, obviously, when you look at, look at, at the Bitcoin protocol, value and trust, you know, a, a, way, a way to, trans, to transmit value. And it does that amazingly well. And I think there'll be other protocols for other things. And therefore, I think we've got to keep an open mind. And actually, I agree with you. You've got to do the work. You've got to dig in and you've got to understand what these protocols are for. What's the consensus mechanism? How decentralized they are? And, um, you know, who, who and why uh, you would want to own that token and what it gives you on, 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 on that particular protocol. Yeah, but keep in mind, you. most protocols that we have today will yeah. die and go away. Yeah, well, That's I suppose when you, look, when, you look at, when you look at Google... <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. I mean, this, Google. Google wasn't the first search engine; it was the twenty-eight search engine, right? So um, they 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 built a you know they built a better mousetrap, and uh, there was, tw- was 27, 27 search engines before that. So totally agree. And you ha- and you have to be innovative. And uh, I think um, you know someone's got to be first through the door. And uh, we we are where we are, but uh, we are certainly a, a lot further in the last. You know, when you really look at when the protocols came out, you know, three to four to five years ago. Um, it's a, it's amazing now that you have, as you rightly said, banks now looking at this DLT technology and now looking at, at, at starting their own. And there's lots of different examples out there, but um, it's 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 a real credit to the techs and the devs uh, and the forward thinkers to get us to where we are. It's not perfect. It's not magic fairy dust, as my man Jimmy Song says, but we are definitely we are definitely closer to having some type of user case or some type of adoption for for this technology. Thanks, Shane. Stephen, it looked like you were about to say something. Do you want to follow up? Yeah, I was just going to say, following on to that, uh, most most retail investors, which is what's really driving, you know, uh, a, a lot of the price action, a lot of the volatility, a lot of the um, uh, speculation, believe that 
and certain with certain protocols, if they own the token, they're getting a piece of that protocol. And that's just simply not the case. So that's the other thing that, that we've got to keep in mind because that's kind of what a lot of the the pumpers and the shillers out there want you to believe that if you that if you buy their token, you're getting you're getting a piece of that protocol. And you just simply aren't. Thanks, Stephen. Linda, did you have a follow-up for that? Otherwise, I have a, another question for you, Shane. Yeah, I was I was just gonna say that di diversification will define your destiny. And it, it really is key. Um, the the one to two percent bets as an investor. Um, that it's really important that you don't make that outsized bet. And we, we do have a lot of potential in the marketplace. So diversifying is, is truly where your, your biggest long-term wins are going to, to be possible from, right? If you don't diversify, you may have bet on the wrong, uh, protocol, I'm going to say protocol, the, the wrong, uh, token or technology, um, and, uh, you know, watch other people be be benefiting from ones that you didn't have the the dry powder to be able to take a shot at. So, yeah, diversification That's is right. key. Well, you know, Thank not, you, not, Linda. Not, yeah. not, not only would I agree with that, and Steve would agree with that, but also a gentleman called Paul Tudor Jones would also agree with diversification. <laughs> and it was excellent to see Paul Tudor Jones come out in the press last week and talk about actually having some exposure to Bitcoin, given given this recent uh, recent uh, coronavirus inflation store of value so um, and he said probably no more no more than one to two percent of their own AUM would be allocated but that is an amazing thing to start to see big money managers now move into the space and have a capital allocation to Bitcoin so uh, you're not you're not alone with your with your good smart recommendations of diversification thank you Shane uh, correct although it was specifically right in futures so it'll be interesting how that works out for him and actually the the following question I do want to ask on inflationary hedges will be to you, Linda. Shane, a follow-up on what you were saying, though, because we were talking about risks as an investor. Now, I think that this is a different type of risk, but very pressing, especially as you were talking about ICOs and various tokens. Many ICOs have been deemed illegal securities, and a lot of people invested in ICOs have been taken to court or are looking at jail time. So what precautions are you taking as a VC to ensure that you don't end up on the wrong side of the law? Yeah, well, um, for, first of all, we don't take any token exposure. We don't invest in ICOs. Uh, we're traditional venture capital, uh, whereby we invest in seed to Series A uh, into blockchain technology companies, but we take equity stakes. Um, and I think really, when I looked at you know the space back in 2017, and we started to um, look to allocate capital into the space, I really wanted to understand where the value would be attributed going forward. Um, when I looked at the very, very early uh, ICO market, it was difficult for me to understand just how to value these type of tokens. And I think Steve on his, on his, on his opening, opening slide said that they were moving in lockstep. And they do because they're not, they're, not, they're not moving on a valuation. They're moving in speculation, right? They're moving on emotion. It's a fear and greed. That's what's moving this crypto market, right? And fear goes through the market a lot more quicker than greed. There's no real use case or valuation, so you can't have diversification with how a token trades when we looked at it i think when 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 i wanted to allocate capital into the space it was alongside the co-founders and the co-founders all had equity so although we're taking exposure into blockchain technology companies it's via the equity side of 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 the trade if there's a token generation event in the future and we happen to get some type of of token um then that's fine we can hold it and we can custody that but for now it's seed to serious a early stage blockchain technology companies, and we've invested alongside the likes of Google Ventures, Alibaba, Warner Music, Galaxy Digital, Kleiner Perkins. And, uh, you know, we're very, very happy to continue on to take equity at this, at this, at this time. Our fund is a 10 year fund, so uh, we're super patient, we're quick to execute. But we realize that this will take time for value to move move through this. And I think when you look at some of the really interesting, you know, transactions that's happened in the, the space, you know, this BlockFi just raised 30 million, a Cool Wallet had a Series B at 16 million, Bact raised uh, 300 million, and, and quite recently, I'm sure everybody saw uh, the uh, coin market cap being acquired for 400 million um, by Binance. So you know, we're starting to see. The big venture funds come in. We're starting to see Series B and Series C, and we're starting to see some M and A and activity. So, although we're very much 
aligned with 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 you know the early stages of of blockchain technology it's it's in equity stakes that that we allocate our capital makes sense thanks shane uh linda moving to you you were talking about in 2017 all the scams that you saw come into the space so as a follow-up to what i asked shane how do you advise people on how to decipher what's a scam what's a bad ico you said that you believe some icos are good so how are you advising people to discern them? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a financial advisor. So that's just the, the sure. classic disclaimer. Um, so I, I don't advise people. I share from personal experience. And I have vetted projects for uh, over 16 months um, just to give them a chance to live up to their promises. Um, you know, I, I am very, very cautious in the the space uh, ICOs in general. I I don't know that there would be one that I would point to. I think that would be foolish. And the the chamber is platform and token agnostic. So we you know we saw on Yavin you know doing a uh, kind of a, a bit of a grilling, I would say, and. Uh, you know, where does the truth lie, right? You know, there's there's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of lack of clarity when it comes to um, what has been legislated and what has, has been regulated on. And the SEC is there to protect the consumer, right? That's their their role and their goal. And so we we work with members of the chamber to communicate if, if they are an entity that has launched a token offering of any sort, um, we facilitate their connection with the SEC to get as much clarity on the front end as possible so that they're not dealing with uncertainty, that they're taking action based on uh, directives that they've received from the SEC or CFTC. And I think that's really important. The, the red flags that are there, you know, are in, in my mind, if you have just massive wallets that um, you have pre-mined uh, tokens, um, you know, the, there's, there's a lot of lack of clarity as to who actually owns the, the site or um, inability to connect directly to members of a team, um, you know, websites that have, you know, a lot of misspellings or you know there's 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 just random stuff that you can very easily take a glimpse at uh you know a white paper um i mean some of those white papers they're so clearly plagiarized you literally can just take chunks and cut and paste them into you know engines that will will highlight plagiarized sections and you know it, it's it's fairly straightforward for anybody if they're wanting to do due diligence to do it um, the, the equity side of things, though, is, is really where I think the, the value uh, lies in, in investing in the, the blockchain and cryptocurrency space. If you can um, find a team, and it really is about the people, right? Um, my last several investments have been very much about the people. Who's leading the team? Who are they drawing, who are they drawing in? Um, you know, what companies are finding value and what they're bringing to the table. And I mean, there's ones like DFM Data Corp that I think is going to revolutionize. I mean, it's going to, uh, I guess revolutionize might be a little too strong a word. It's going to create um, a, a new space and a new way of doing business in digital freight matching. And it's, it's being run by the gentleman who actually wrote the patent for digital freight matching like in 2004, before we even had those Blackberries that you were talking about, um, you know, he, he was seeing how there could be this infrastructure to allow for the most optimal connection of drivers and trailers and loads. And, and he, he wrote the algorithms to facilitate that. And, you know, so a bet like that, you know, knowing that he's coming to the table with a strong team and, uh, with a technology that can reduce carbon emissions by over 30%, that can bring together a marketplace that's never been in existence and has been so so fractured and and um, rife with uh, um, I don't even know what the word is to use, but lots of money goes in in places that that don't really bring value to commerce. So 
I, I think there's going to be some real efficiencies that are going to be brought into a lot of areas. You know, supply chain is, is just one of those um, impact zones that blockchain has. And, you know, would I would I recommend um, any specific one? But I'm no, I'm, I'm happy to to share where I've put my money because. Well, not all the places I put my money because that's really not everybody's business. Um, but I, I eat my own dog food, right? So I'm, I'm not uh, I'm not pretending. I'm I'm actually invested in over thirty blockchain-based projects. So it's um, it's important to do your own due diligence and then seek the um, the experience base of people who might have been in the space longer than you. Like on Yavin, you know, he's he's dug deep and um, you know he's he's you know not shy to pull. Uh, you know, that together and share it. So, and, but even there, you know, part of doing your due diligence is referencing um, people that have done lots of due diligence themselves, but it's still on you, right? It's, it's your, it's your capital growth over time. Um, so yeah, it, it's uh, a personal decision. Thank you, Linda. And Stephen, um, furthering on this conversation and that I'm hearing a lot about the importance of digital equities can you talk about how you view structuring your portfolios, including digital assets? Do you prefer securities? Do you look for futures, derivatives? What are you thinking when you decide, all right, it's time to buy? Yeah. <clears throat> well, at the moment, so so we run a, um, a, a macro fund that can invest pretty much in anything fintech related, uh, as well as you know, with a focus on blockchain. Um, now, that being said, that we, we can invest in anything, stocks, bonds, um, derivatives, commodities, futures, currencies, venture, real estate, uh, really, really anything that's out there, but we have a, a, a slant towards anything that has a, um, that, is, that is digitized, so to speak, where the transfer agents on the blockchain or um, there, or, or you can electronically trade it. Um, at the moment, the only place that I really see value at all is is in venture, um, you know, venture and um, and and bonds actually. So, uh, really thinking about a barbell approach in a portfolio where uh, where we're investing in bonds, where I see a lot of capital appreciation and safety on one side, and venture on the other. And the venture investments that we make are. Um, our fintech in nature, um, and in a lot of cases, um, blockchain enabled. Uh, so, um, you know, one of one of our more notable investments, in, in my opinion, is 3IQ. And I don't know if anybody knows 3IQ, but they uh, they launched the very first um, Bitcoin publicly traded fund in Canada. Really great team, doing a lot of really cool things, and. Um, so, so that's really interesting. Um, I, I like I like that asset management space where they're playing within regulatory frameworks. Uh, I also like the future of work. Um, there's a lot of good deals out there that uh, focus on, on on payments for for freelancers that I'm involved in. Um, and then um, and then we also like anything that that focuses globally uh, as far as uh, transfers of securities, transfers of payments. Um, Anything that works cross border, uh, so that's that's where a lot of our venture is focused right now. Um, you know, previous to about two months ago, there really weren't a whole lot of good deals in the market. You know, there was that that blockchain premium, um, but a lot of people have come down to earth in the last couple of months, and um, and, and we're starting to see really good deals again. Um, w whether they're in, in entirely enabled in blockchain or 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 blockchain as an ancillary uh, a function of what they do. Um, but we are starting to see uh, a lot of good deals. Uh, there's a couple that I'm pretty excited about that we're in the due diligence phase for. Um, but, um, but that's, yeah, frankly, that's, 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 that's where the value is today. I, I don't want to own really any kind of ICO or tokens or, 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 or crypto at the moment, just because, you know, I see, I see that along with equity markets or any kind of risk assets, um, you know, probably display a fair amount of volatility in the next few months, uh, even over the next year. Uh, but when when that changes, then we'll probably come in and, and we want to own physical. Um, I I'm, I'm I'm very much against owning, um, you know, futures, especially you know 
Leah, you mentioned earlier, uh, John Tudor Jones, um, his exposure to Bitcoin is really through cash settled futures, which isn't actually exposure to Bitcoin at all um, and uh, contains a fair amount of volatility. And as I think he's going to find out very quickly that, um, you know, Bitcoin is a manipulated market and over the weekend is usually when the manipulation happens because uh, all the quote unquote, you know, smart Wall Street traders aren't working over the weekends. And that's where they can, you know, that's where the manipulators can get the most juice. So, um, so you know, the futures market is definitely going to, you know, suffer by only, you know, trading during the week. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens there. Uh, but I, I want to own it directly. You know, just Thanks, just Steven. to give some oh. value to to some some of the participants that are look that are looking in, and to try to really kind of keep it simple, right? Um, sure you could go off and try to pick the next ICO. But when you look at past performance of ICOs, where 99.9% .9 of, all, of all ICOs are down 99.9%, .9%, when you look at historic returns, although there, there are no prediction of future returns, it's pretty crap. So maybe, maybe to keep away from, which is already a, you know, a, a difficult asset class, even to value, let alone execute, and then you put a blockchain component in on it, it's, it's, it's pretty much speculation. You might as well just go to Vegas. But if you do want to, and you do believe in the space, of course, why not just buy the market cap? Why not just buy something that's correlated to the market cap? Maybe like a Bitcoin, which is, which is you know, you know high, highly correlated to the overall market capitalization, or buy that just in itself. I think just holding the market cap and playing that longer term, I think it's a smart idea. Um, you're, not gonna have, you're not gonna have the situation of, of individual ICO execution risk. And uh, if the market goes up with the main components of the market, then, of course, you'll, you'll generate returns. Of course, in the DeFi space, there's a lot of interesting things happening there. I mean, there's two, two companies that we're looking at, Avi and Balancer Labs, which are really, really interesting. But when you look at the DeFi space, there's a lot of different ways that you can generate returns. And, and, and looking at the staking or the lending space, you know, you start to see some companies in there offering anywhere up to 6% return. Um, on 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 your Bitcoin position. So if you do hold some cryptocurrencies and you maybe don't want to sell them or trade them, there is uh, lots of different lending platforms out there which you can generate reasonably good returns uh, on on interest rates. Considering that global interest rates in 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 normal markets are 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 pretty much zero. So there's a, there is other options out there. Thanks. And actually, as a follow-up, so I will stop being a dictator, and I'm getting questions from the audience. Thank you, Daniel. I'll actually turn it right back to you, Shane. This one is for you. Um, you were talking about staking. So the question is actually, what do you think of services like staking? Would you consider investing into staking pools as part of your portfolio diversification? Yeah, we've looked at, we've looked at quite a lot of... Uh... Of those particular ones, uh, BlockFi, Celsius are two ones which come which come to mind. Um, uh, we don't have either positions in any of them, um, so uh, I think that as as the overall cryptocurrency and blockchain space evolves and we start to see market cap go up, um, I think that there will be need for uh, borrow, which allows uh, individuals our funds to go short. So. Uh, these type these type of of services provide you to cover the short, um, and also when you look at interest rates, and I I, I believe it's up to I think it's five BTC that you can get six percent. Um, that's a pretty you know great return. Um, we we don't operate uh, and have a return, but if I was a yielding fund and I was getting six percent, uh, that would be that would be pretty good. So uh, by all means, I think they're great businesses. We haven't invested in any yet, but I'm very familiar with the players in the market. Thank you. Steven, so there's been mentions of a Ripple IPO by the CEO, Brad Garlinghouse. How do you anticipate that IPOs such as that would affect the price of those tokens? <laughs> do I have to answer that? Um, so, look, um, I'm going to say that I, I've never owned Ripple. And, um, however, I actually believe that, that, that Ripple is probably set up to be a winner. And, and the reason why is they've done a great job of working with a lot of, um, with a lot of companies for borderless transactions. 
and but but Ripple itself as a as a as a as a token or a cryptocurrency uh, is probably positioned to be something more closely related to a stablecoin. Uh, the way that they want to use it, sort of like a replacement for um, you know, cash transactions. Um, man, I don't even know how to answer that. That's a good question. Um, but <laughs> but yeah, you, you're right. You really got, uh, if you really got the IPO, Steve. there would be a lot of speculation and a lot of different tokens, including XRP. What you really got to look at is what what is what is the actual fungibility of the equity holding compared to the token? Like, what's the relationship between both of them? And actually, you're probably going to float Ripple Labs. So um, it's difficult to derive. And this is an issue where you have a traditional equity, which you are a shareholder, and you also have a digital asset from a company. How do they actually intertwine? Um, that's 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 the hard part. And by the way, should, should it well be said, an initial public offering? Well said, because people are going to speculate on XRP, believing that it has something to do with Ripple, and it will shoot up in value, and then they'll lose all their money. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I'll, I'll speak into this really yep. quickly, because Linda, I, this I is actually... You're ending the panel here, so whatever I, I have thoughts actually you have on this. Owned, thank you. Uh, I've actually owned XRP, and I, I got it around 30 cents and uh, ran it up over $3 and sold it. And the only reason I owned it, <laughs> the only reason I owned it is because I believed in the power of the team to do great publicity. And I yeah. knew that they were, they were on a, an uptrend and I just did it as a market play. Um, I don't see them as a, a decentralized um, use of, of blockchain in any way, shape, or form. I think if they were being fair to the people who purchased XRP and held, that they would assign an, an equity value to that and make sure that the people who hold XRP actually get to, to benefit from an equity token as well. I don't know how they could manage that, but... I, I think there was a, a big part of the community that thought owning XRP was owning a share in Ripple, and that's that's a that's a shame. Um, and it has to do with education, and that's in part what we have to do, um, and what we do through the chamber is we help educate the community about what is real and help them make smarter choices. And if if we as a community are like on did. Um, calling things out and then giving people pause instead of jumping in with the hype cycle side of things and actually engaging in the marketplace because they have been educated as to the potential value adds and the, the different business use cases, then we're going to have a, a much better adoption cycle next time when, when we have uh, greater numbers coming into the marketplace. So. Fantastic ending note. All right, everybody, Stephen, Shane, Linda, thank you so much for being my panelist. Thank you. Thank Lovely you. to meet you all. And please, You're wonderful. Be, safe, be sound. Thank you all very much for, uh, for your time today. Really appreciate it. Hope you have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you, Leah, and every other panelist for this insightful talk. I would like to welcome our next speaker, Armin Schmidt, who is the CEO of Swiss Crypto Tokens and Head of Crypto Payments at Bitcoin Swiss. Armin is going to talk about wrapped Bitcoin on Tezos blockchain. Very much looking forward to what you have to say. Armin, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot, and um, I hope uh, you all can see me and uh, can hear um, my voice. Um, I will um, share a couple of slides and I would love to share um, the idea we brought to life when we said let's uh, push the uh, crypto ecosystem also on Tesla's blockchain. So I'm just sharing right now the screen and then I would love to kick it off. Um, so maybe um, a few words first about um, myself and those about um, uh, Bitcoin Swiss. Um, so back in the days, um, we have launched, um, and I think that's already on the next page, back in the days, about one and a half years ago, um, we have launched uh, the Crypto Frank on the Ethereum blockchain. And, and we have founded for this reason Swiss Crypto Tokens, uh, which then um, is the issuer of a stablecoin uh, called XCHF. And 
we call it the Swiss franc stablecoin. And the reason why I start with this, because you have to understand, uh, because we are part of the Bitcoin Swiss ecosystem, um, we um, did not only plan this to bring this to life um, on the Ethereum blockchain, but uh, definitely also on other blockchains. And so, um, as you can see here, for example, we are also listed on, on Bitfinex and IDEX. We have a Uniswap contract. We have had some, um, some uh, DeFi uh, cases in real estate, but also in shares. So the token can be used and is a plain vanilla ERC20 token, if you would say so. A uh, couple of details you can find, find on the website um, swisscryptotokens.ch. This is where we are. And so coming then to the discussion why um, we, together with the Tesos Foundations, um, have started to talk about it. And, and we have um, had some vibrant discussions back in the days. And uh, you also uh, might know that uh, Bitcoin Swiss was um, fortunate to be um, part of the ICO, um, actually the facilitator of the ICO of the Tezos uh, blockchain and therefore there is a long, long tradition and long close relationship actually with the Tezos Foundation and he said let's, let's make sure that we bring uh, somehow this ecosystem to life and the first and most um, simple actually view was let's bring the crypto franc which is um, as I mentioned here um, on the left and on the first page uh, on the Ethereum blockchain as an ERC20 token Let's bring this over to uh, the Tesos blockchain. And okay, it's good. It's better like this. Okay, thank you um, uh, for the, the comment. So um, we said, hey, let's bring uh, the crypto franc to the Tesos blockchain. Uh, the crypto franc, you also have to know from a, from, a, from a setup perspective, is obviously a Swiss franc backed stablecoin. We have 100% um, um, uh, money um, as, a, as real money in the, in the, in the, in the vault. So it's, uh, it's cash. We sit on cash in the end and it's insured. And we said, because uh, the setup is an asset token, a security, uh, it might not be that easy to bring this over to uh, the uh, Tezos blockchain. But why not, um, why not trying to find out if we can see if we can make a, a wrap Bitcoin? And uh, there is another protocol, another project um, on the Ethereum side, um, um, wrap Bitcoin, as you also might know. We looked into a little bit uh, how they have done it. We, we tried to find out how can it really be done. And then they said, Let's just try it. Let's try it to, to uh, create a market. And we said, uh, this is something we can also bring back to the community. This is something we would love to, to see also live um, on, a, on a Tesos blockchain and really also support this quite um, great and vibrant um, ecosystem and community on the uh, Tesos side. You also have to know Bitcoin Swiss is completely agnostic in terms of blockchains. Obviously, we are called Bitcoin Swiss. <laughs> because um, we are there since 2013 and back in the days we were the only ones and the first ones um, here in Switzerland um, and therefore the Bitcoin name was definitely something we said is, uh, is, quite, is quite important and uh, was the only blockchain back in the days really known to the public. Um, this is a little bit the busy slide but I think that's the only slide which, uh, which definitely makes a uh, a lot of content out of it. So we then said, hey, let's see how can we launch this wrapped Bitcoin project. And the most important, and I think uh, many people here in the audience also would um, uh, hopefully say the same, go and look into the details how the legal setup is. And uh, we spent quite some time, quite some um, effort also in discussions and also finding the right uh, open-minded law firm to come up with a setup which is based uh, on Swiss law, just to make clear, it might vary uh, from a market to another market. But we said, hey, let's uh, make sure that we have a token which is good here in Switzerland. We have this uh, Swiss-based ecosystem and we want to make sure it, it will work. And uh, yes, we found a solution which is linked to a, a multi-sig setup so not everybody uh, can uh, get access to those underlying Bitcoins. And therefore, uh, this setup um, is, uh, is good and can be really used in, in Switzerland here. Um, we then started to look into the brief. So let's make sure that it's um, understood what we really would like to understand. And, and this um, uh, was uh, done in multiple iterations. 
and I can tell you um, some good thoughts went into this as well. And then I think quite important because we then started from a, from a legal setup and we had the brief with the vision, how can you bring those Bitcoins over to the um, Tesla's blockchain and therefore combining the two uh, blockchains uh, with some use cases, we then started to um, come up with uh, the group. And the team in the end um, is fairly simple. You might have heard about the, the crypto valley here in, in Switzerland. Um, it's mostly linked uh, around the location here in Zug. We are also part of the Zug um, um, location. And therefore, you know each other. And I think uh, since you know each other, you also trust each other and we have an active community here. And so we started uh, to find the orchestrate, which is the Bitcoin Association uh, Switzerland. We then have a couple of key holders who get access to the multi-sig setup. And we also, also have a couple of gatekeepers who are active uh, in the market as well. Usually those are uh, crypto brokers like uh, Bitcoin Swiss, uh, but also others like BT, Signum, um, Wharton, etc. So you, you see that there's a there's a vibrant there's a vibrant um, community there as well. Um, very important then was the smart contract, and um, because um, our focus back in the days was uh, linked to to Bitcoin and Ethereum, definitely open to others uh, other uh, blockchains, but we weren't really able to um, do any um, uh, smart contract coding in um, in the native language in in um, in Tesos, and therefore for the Tesos blockchain, and therefore we found someone. Um, they have been able to execute this as well. And it was quite quite some time. So we started the project last year around summer, and then we went live a couple of weeks ago. So therefore, it definitely took some time, definitely took some iterations. And I think one of the, impose, uh, if the important element was the token standard. You might uh, understand the um, ERC20 setup on uh, the Ethereum blockchain. FA 1.2 is somehow similar. And the TQ Group and Serocal, uh, they also have uh, talked about this in, in public, therefore I'm able to, to, uh, to publish the names here. But it was quite an effort for those guys to make sure that not only the, stand, that the token standard uh, was there, but then also somehow this went into the, the smart contract itself. And so you can really launch a new product based on a standard, which then also can be reviewed. Um, an important next element was then the multi-sig setup uh, with a Ledger Nano S um, 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 uh, hardware wallet. And um, it was not that easy, but we, we managed to to get with the teams to, to get this done. Um, quite important again was then uh, the Linux setup because I'm a business guy. I'm not I'm not a, an Android crypto guy, but in the end you need someone who helps to um, set up this these Linux machines. And uh, yes, friends in the infrastructure department are there. Everything is just as valid um, as long as you know that it's really valid and you really have um, um, an, an audited smart contract. So least authority was able to to uh, provide us with an with an with a with an audited smart contract, so to make sure there are no backdoors built in, and it's 100% um, clean. Um, yes, it's nice that you have a smart contract. Yes, it's nice that you have a legal setup. Yes, it's nice that you have somehow a group together, but you want to see something, and therefore the blockchain explorer has to be contacted. Uh, this is that test blocks and uh, TCATs uh, as well. Um, therefore, um, yes, we have been able to talk to them as well, and make sure that they are there. Blockchain Explorer, then wallet integration. As I mentioned uh, with Ledger, we were already there. We have a second one, which is called AirGap. Um, the, the company behind is called Papers.ch, also um, uh, a company here in the, in the uh, Crypto Valley ecosystem. Um, again, then we have those legal setup. We have the key holders and gatekeeper. We then looked into the templates uh, because you also have some contractual relationship. Uh, it's fairly loose, but still you want to have something in written. And therefore, we have um, those templates then done as well, provided by, you can imagine, the same good and open-minded uh, law firm we have used for this. Website is there as well. I'll come back to this. And um, many friends with passion and lots of iterations said, yes, let's do this. Um, and then a lot of a lot of uh, work, and I can tell you, a lot of work went into in the testing and deployment of the, of the smart contract. We did two efforts. Um, we have realized there was a little error in, which is good. So let's test it and make sure that um, we can we can fix this. Has been fixed, and then we have now uh, launched a second um, uh, smart contract, which is there and which can be also seen. 
they have launched this um, um, end of um, end of March, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's also written then on the next page. Um, we then uh, tested everything. Everything was fine. We then also added a couple of um, bitcoins to make sure that everything really works. We then did a press release uh, again, lots of iterations. We then said yes, let's launch, because it was somehow um, it's not a it's not a waterfall project. It's something you really want to do this in the community. So you need some strong leaders behind this as well. And finally, said boom, let's do it. Let's go live and let's make sure that everything is there. And then we have launched the website, and then also the uh, social media setup was something we uh, had to look into as well. Therefore, it is um, quite interesting to, to see how this uh, went live, and um, that's uh, where we are. That's my last page, and um, everything can be seen. Um, also, and it's also public. Uh, we have an MIT license attached to the code, uh, to everything you can you can see also online. Um, so it's uh, on TCPTCIO. You can see the uh, website um, unleash your Bitcoin on Tezos. Um, you see that we have something like um, 357.9 Bitcoins already um, there. And therefore, we have the same value of um, wrapped Bitcoin, the TCBTC is um, uh, uh, currently in circulation. Top right, you see a Blockchain Explorer picture where those uh, tokens are there and you can also access them. And I think as a as a final summary, and I think that's that's quite important. Um, many many companies, and yes, we have been fortunate also to be part of this uh, Tezos um, collaboration for for quite some time. But I think you want to start something. You want to make sure that you have a couple of cool ideas. There's also a new um, blockchain with some great people behind as well. So we know the um, the Tezos foundations really well, and uh, they're just next door uh, to us. And therefore, we said, let's do something together. Let's have some ideas and let's see um, how we can bring them to life, to life, structure them. And then, as I mentioned already um, on my last page uh, before, um, start with the legal setup. I think um, what Bitcoin Swiss is doing, what Swiss Crypto Tokens uh, as well is doing, and also what um, the Tezos Foundation and the Tezos guys in general are doing, you want to make sure that you have a legal setup that really works. Otherwise, you have something and then, uh, for example, the Financial um, Market Authority, FINMA here in Switzerland, will maybe come back to you and say, hey, something is wrong, it's whatever. And therefore, that's important. And then, quite openly, create an ecosystem around the community. I think that's, that's uh, an essential element as well start thinking uh, about further use cases and really make sure that they are there. We have now one smart contract, one token life. People tell us, yeah, you don't have that much traction yet. Yes, that's right as well. It's the first the first um, uh, the token there on the Tesla's blockchain in a smart contract uh, setup. Yes, we don't have that big business model yet, but hopefully it will it will um, come up in the in the in the near future. And then along this you can start to establish um, a market. Uh, with a long-term perspective. I think that's that's quite important to make sure that, yes, we are there to uh, power first, not only um, a new blockchain, an ecosystem in the future, but then definitely also the people behind that. And I think that's the most important piece I would like to share here in this audience. So you can go back to tcbtc.io. Um, everything is live, everything is public. Um, there are also the, the, the smart contracts and everything is uh, on GitHub. Um, go have a look at it, um, do some stuff on, on Tezos as well. Happy to um, be part of this team. And I think with this, I will stop sharing here, um, if I can do so. Um, yes, um, and with um, this, I would say, um, I am more or less done with my presentation. I don't think uh, there were some questions uh, recorded, uh, or there are some questions, but happy if you have some questions to answer them. Well, thank you very much, Armin, for this great talk. Um, I think the questions might be posted later, but for now, we're good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So our next speaker is Jonas Lamis. Jonas is the founder and CEO of StakerDAO, and he's a long-time participant in Tezos, where he ran one of the largest public validators, Tezos.